thank you so much for coming. This is like late afternoon Saturday. You know, we all probably had something, to, a little bit to drink yesterday, today. At least I didn't get the morning sessions because, well, it's, it's, sometimes it's tough to wake up. Uh, my name is Alex, and uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about machine learning, a little bit about big data, a little bit about data science, and hopefully you guys are not going to lynch me out of the room. I'm going to try to make this as pleasant as humanly possible, and also try to demystif demystify a little bit uh, what all these things are, or they should be, in the real world, and how we can potentially use this to our advantage, right? We, I mean. I guess if, if, uh, if marketing people, I, I had someone say that yesterday, actually it was, I think it was Ali, if marketing people are using this, why aren't we? Why, we were supposedly smarter than them. So let's see what we can do. So first of all, for some reason I'm on the breaking track, but this is not about breaking, this is about building, right? There's no lead Android malware the old day that I'm dropping here, and uh, no systems were harmed, right? The only thing I'm gonna break is the time limit because there's a lot to go through. And there is a little bit of math, and there's considerably less math than the last time I tried to, I, I presented this uh, at the, fir the first iteration of my, of my talk in, in DEF CON. So I'm trying to tone this a little bit down, make it, not dumb down, but make it more accessible and make, maybe make the, the, the examples a little bit more punchy, a little bit more clear, so that you guys can understand a little bit better what's the, what's, what am I trying to accomplish here. And, okay, who is this guy, right? Uh, I've been doing uh, InfoSec for about 13 years now, and the reason why you've never heard about me, because I've been doing this in Brazil mostly, and, uh, and very heavily on security consultancy and network monitoring in general. So I used to run uh, more than one team at, at the same time, where, where people, they, were, they were running security operation centers, and they had all different kinds of challenges in applying uh, even normal uh, monitoring techniques to the tools that we have available, right? We used the, uh, the, the company I used to work for, we used to uh, run uh, tools that you can buy off the shelf, we used to customize a little bit of our stuff, and uh, it was all very tough. If there was any way that a SIM solution could hurt you, I was hurt by it, I have all the scars to show, and thank you so much, you were very kind, you were very kind. And um, the fact is, after I took, I, I took some time off from the company and I started to uh, actually uh, delve a lot into machine learning, into data science, uh, first as, a, as an interest, right? It sounds cool, right? All the cool kids are doing it. It can be that bad. And then I started to really understand that, yeah, there could be some very practical applications on what we're doing here, on what, how we can help information security with this. And uh, I did some research, I did some, some interesting things that I presented on, on DEF CON and Black Hat, and uh, I started what I'm calling uh, the, the MLSAC project in, in July th uh, 2014, which was what we released in, in DEF CON. Anyway, enough about me. So we're talking, we're gonna start with definitions. Oh, louder, okay. I don't know if you were telling me something different. I have no idea, but now I get it. Thank you so much. Uh, so we are going to start with definitions here, and big data, data science, machine learning, all, the, all these things. Just want to make sure everyone is on the same page. And uh, why am I doing this? How do, why do I believe that this is applicable? Why we should be bothering about this? Uh, a little bit about network security monitoring and the challenges. I'm pretty sure everyone here will identify. And a, b a little bit with more detail about the work that I'm doing. And uh, if you guys are interested in this, in general, in doing data analysis around log data, how could you guys potentially get started? So, well, I guess we should start by defining stuff. So, this is big data, right? So. Any marketing people will tell you this is exactly what it is. It's unicorns and rainbows, and it's a robot unicorn, even because, it's, of course, it's machine learning, and uh, it will solve all your problems, right? Everything, now, you can all go home because the problem is solved, right? And, uh, yeah, and I, I was very hopeful as well, right? And then I'm starting to dig into this, and I'm starting to understand a little bit more. Maybe I get a, get a little bit biased, less biased, 
uh, understanding of what these things are and how they could be applicable. So I started to ask Google what Google thinks that those things are. And if you guys do this right now, it, this is exactly what shows up. This was a couple of days ago. So the first one is, is actually teenage sex. I had no idea why they, it cut it off. I didn't even have safe search on. But the point is that everyone's talking about it and no one's really doing it at all, all right. So, but you can see there's a lot of diverse opinions there. And I love the statistics on a Mac stuff. That's all that data science do all day. And uh, anyway, it's, it's complicated, right? And uh, one of the things that I'm, I'm, I want to do here is, I mean, of course there's a lot of hype, of course there's a lot of marketing push. People have got to make a living. People have got to sell stuff, so they will always oversell. And, uh, but there is, there's a reason why people are talking about this. This is not just like marketing nonsense, so to speak. So let's try to unpack this a little bit and make sure we are on the right track. So most of the time you'll ask people what big data is and it's gonna be just like uh, when you're working with your PCI QSA. You'll get two people in the room, you'll get three definitions out of them of what the big data is. But in a nutshell, what you should care about is that it isn't actually a thing, but it's a kind of an ecosystem where people are mainly storing data in bulk and they are being able to process information and process this, uh, this data and run queries and run programs against it in a repeatable and, de I say dependable, but uh, it actually, uh, uh, there's a lot of resilience built in because you, you can expect things to break, especially on this scale. But uh, things will eventually, if you, if you code your stuff right, you eventually get some sort of response. And uh, you don't have to worry too much about this. This is not a talk about big data. But uh, when people tell you big data, big data is not a box. Big data is not something that, uh, although people will try to sell you big data as a box. Uh, but it's, it's an ecosystem. There's a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff we have to think about this. What about data science? Well, data science is a little bit more tricky because it's this kind of new thing that's showing up. Thanks again, guys. This is... And uh, we are... There's this great definition by the, the, the director of research in Cloud Data, which is better statistics than a software engineer and better software engineer than statistics. It's kind of a, and it's interesting because nowadays what people expect data scientists to be is the kind of guy who can do anything. So this is the guy that will, in a way, be able to run your NoSQL or your Hadoop environment. He will know statistics. He will know uh, data, vi data visualization. He will know machine learning. He will know all sorts of different things. And when I think about this, it kind of reminds me of the, the, web at the web masters we had like 20 years ago. The guy who would run the website of your company, the guy was supposed to know everything. And he didn't really do everything, anything right. He just knew like bits and pieces of the stuff. And uh, he, would, he would do his best. And eventually, people got a little bit more technical, a little bit more professionalized. And you got some specific people that would be taking care of specific things. And um, when you think about what a data science should do in a nutshell, he would be able to put together these three uh, interesting, these three things in this Venn diagram. He would have to, first of all, have hacking skills. What hacking skills means, it's a startup speak for development, right? But you guys are on the Bay Area, you guys know this. I have to explain this to a lot of people because, oh yeah, I'm hacking stuff. Oh, anyway, uh, the substantive expertise, you have to know what you're talking about. So if you want to do an analyzed data that is regarding to finance, you might as well know finance because you're just going to start digging through it, you have absolutely no idea what's going on, and you have to try to, if you're going to try to get some insight out of that, you want to make sure that you, you, you understand what you're trying to do. And one of the most important and overlooked uh, things is the actual statistics knowledge, because it's very easy to make mistakes, and I think it's important, I think the thing that will stick the best with this audience is that bad statistics when you're working with these things, it's just like bad crypto, right? You will know, oh, I know the name of this. This is a normal distribution, right? 
and then you're doing just like Adobe, and you are uh, encrypt, re reverse encrypting your, your passwords, with the, totally not what you should do in this situation. But just keep that in mind. Finally, machine learning, right? And I'm gonna, stick, I'm gonna st spend some time with this, is uh, when you have data, and it's big or not, it doesn't really matter, right? All of this initial research I did is, was in small data, and uh, even now uh, that I've, got, I've been working with some, with some uh, different companies with their data, I'm barely, barely scratching uh, low terabytes, so it's, it's I, I, I wouldn't really go as far as saying, hey, it's big data, yeah, we're like, I, I know everything because I have all the, it, it doesn't really work like that, right? But uh, you have some data, and you have this analytical capability, or you have, at least have this, capa this analytical intent, what you're trying to do with machine learning is really to not so much, uh, given that you have insights on the data, how could you potentially tell a machine or teach a machine how to derive the same kinds of insights automatically, right? You're not automatically, you're not uh, so much coding the program of what, the, 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 what, what it should tell you, but you're giving it information so that it can identify different things around the data, what you're trying to describe, and uh, it will uh, come up on its own on, on if something is this color or that color, but you have to explain to it. And that's, that's really the hard part of uh, working with this. The algorithms are all known, and everything is very straightforward. There's, there's, there's some good, um, uh, both academic and even practical documentation on what you should be using on each case but it's, it's all about the description and how you teach the computer to recognize thing A versus thing B versus thing C or whatever you're trying to do. So just getting a little bit more technical before I go into some more tangible examples. Uh, there's two large kinds of machine learning and that's all I'm gonna ask you guys to remember is that you're either doing supervised learning which pretty much means that you're telling the computer this is the description of what I'm, I'm telling you to to what, what I want you to tell apart for me, right? These are the, what we call features in, in machine learning talk. And these are the labels. So here's a, a bunch of data about this specific uh, construct or this specific object. And I believe that this data is malicious or this data is type A. And I'm giving it to the system. And I give them a bunch of examples of type A and type B and all those different uh, features that I, I, I calculated. And then, after I give it enough and train it, if I just give it the numbers, if I just give it the features, it should be able to tell me if it's type A or type B, right? So very broadly, you either get a classification problem, which is, I wanna tell if it's A or B, or you get a regression problem, which is, okay, I'm defining that A is, for instance, minus one, and B is one, and I wanna find somewhere in the spectrum, where does this thing lie? Is this more of a type A, is this more, of a type B or something like that. So in the case of unsupervised learning, you have absolutely no idea what you're doing. You're just feeding it data and all these different features that you're trying to describe. You don't really know if you can tell them apart. You don't really know a lot about this data, but you wanna see uh, if the, the computer can find some patterns and can find some distinctions between different kinds of data. So when we talk about clustering, uh, it's one of the most, uh, common, I'd say, uh, maybe primitive in the sense that people have moved uh, uh, a little bit, a lot further than this in fraud detection. But uh, if you're trying to figure out if someone is deviating from their normal pattern, right, you would have a bunch of observations from what these people do, where they buy stuff, what they're doing, how much they're spending on their credit card on a specific reason. And all of these uh, observations would, if you think about there's, a, there's a, a kind of a space, they would all sit, sit close to each other, and then if someone spends like $10,000 in the middle of Africa, yeah, that's quite far away from what we, we were seeing before, so that's one of the uses you'd have of a classing algorithm. Or what we call the composition, which is mostly a tool for when you're doing the data analysis. Uh, it pretty much means that, okay, I got way too much information about this, and I'm trying to figure out which one of these pieces of information is the most relevant for me if I was trying to build a model or something like this. So you pretty much decompose uh, like 
think about a matrix. You have a huge matrix, millions and millions of rows, and you're trying to see if the, there's a matrix multiplication that becomes that. Kind of like prime factoring, but much, much simpler. I mean, people can actually do this, but you're trying to figure out what are the most important information that you can get from all of this data, so that then you can simplify this model and try to work it with the less data you have, the, usually the more, the less features you have, usually the model is a little bit more stable, you get a little less um, trouble around this. So anyway, let's try to move to a more practical example, right? So I'm trying to, let's say I create a machine learning model where I'm trying to tell apart a cat and a dog, right? And uh, I have to describe to the computer what a cat and a dog is, right? And uh, I can define all sorts of different characteristics about the cats and dogs. I can think if they're happy or they're sad or grumpy even. Uh, if they, are, they have pointy ears, yeah, it's not very good. What's the color of the fur? Do they wear a tie? There's a lot of different things that I can do. And the selection process of what are the features that I want to give it to them is, is one of the most important things, because if I'm not able to describe to the computer efficiently uh, what is the difference between them, and in a, in a world where I only have grumpy cats and I only have emergency puppies, right, in order to feed my, my, my algorithm, I would have a lot of challenge classifying this cat, <laughs> right? I mean, it's a happy cat. There's no such thing as happy cats. It doesn't, it, it, the computer will not understand, right? And if for some reason uh, what I'm trying, I'm, I have a cute, high cuteness level, right, on the dogs. All the dogs are cute. I'll definitely have trouble with this guy, right? <laughs> this guy is never going to be classified as a dog. So anyway, this is machine learning, guys. Don't let anybody tell you anything different. That, this is it. And uh, just for the sake of my friends here, I just gave a classification example where I'm trying to tell a dog or a cat apart. If you do a regression, right, it would look something like this. <laughs> So it's somewhere, somewhere in between. But I guess the, the point I'm trying to make here is that uh, it's important what data you're ingesting, right? So is there a bias in the data that you're selecting? Do you only get grumpy cats? Do you only get cute dogs? And this is a lot of the work that you have to do when you're trying to ingest this and try to determine if the data that you're, cre when you're creating the model, you're feeding it, it's good, right? Because the idea is that the models will generally get better with more data. So if you have more data, if you have more knowledge about the problem that you're trying to do, it should get better if you're not just going way into a crazy direction where you're just missing out on a whole spectrum of the population. So there's this, this old fight, this old fight, I mean, this, this, this field hasn't been, t hasn't been taking up speed uh, for, I mean, a few years. So, I mean, there's a couple of years ago fight where uh, is it better to have better algorithms or more data? Usually more data, if you have something simpler that you can do, but you have more data for it, you're usually in a, in a good position. And you also have to be very careful about adversaries. There was a, a much better talk than this uh, today about adversarial intent on, on these kinds of things. This is always something that you have to be cognizant. And especially in our field, it's something that's relevant. So very quickly about this, because I'm totally uh, way out of line uh, in the time. Uh, some applications, of course, of machine learning in general, sales, everybody knows the recommendations engine from Amazon, right? And uh, the algorithms on trading, right? This is everywhere, this is one of the flash crashes, right? And uh, the algorithms are doing a much, I, I don't know if better job, but certainly a much faster job than us in, in trading this. And the image and voice recognition, this is the, the cat thing from Google, right? So I was, I was joking about cats, they actually did it. They put like, I don't know, 60, I think for 16,000 computers on a deep neural network to try to identify cats in pictures. It shows me two things. First of all, they really, really know their audience, right? And the second thing is that if this is not a sign that we're living in the future, where we have robots watching the cat videos, I don't know what it is, <laughs> really. But the, the point is, all right, all of this machine learning, but Alex, you're a security guy. Why you do this, right? I mean, uh, uh, and I talked to, uh, not you guys, you guys are, you guys, you guys are probably, I don't know, I'm being very polite, but when I tell people what I'm trying to do, they're like, yeah, cool, right, and they move away, or are you high, bro, what you're doing? 
And uh, of course, my favorite is, why aren't you doing some cool research like Android Mauer, you know? Because all the cool kids are doing it. So, and I kind of understand this is a new field and we're all very, uh, how can I say, we have historically been uh, uh, paranoid, maybe even be the right word, right? When people are trying to shove a concept down our throats and that's the, the, the ne next big thing, amazing thing that's gonna save our, I mean, we have been promised over and over again in security, maybe a little bit more than IT, that the next thing is the thing that's going to, to solve our problems. It's, information security is the biggest Ponzi scheme of all. And, um, and also, of course, math is hard, right? And probability, even more so. And uh, I also understand why this is not so, not a, a few that every, not any, all of people would be interested in, but uh, it's kind of fun. I mean, I, I will, I will uh, come forward here and say, I had to take introduction to statistics at least four times to start to wrap my head around this. It's like, it's a disaster. It's, uh, when I did it first time in undergrad, I was like, please go away, please go away, please go away. Anyway, now I know, almost. But even in security, right, we have been doing this. We think we haven't, but we have been doing this. Fraud detection systems are this. This is what they have been doing for a while. And they're trying to apply this knowledge to a very, usually to a very specific problem, a very specific product, right? When you have this, uh, this uh, huge understanding of a specific domain, right? You know what the product is, you know what the product does. The guy who built the product is right across the, 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 the room from you. You can usually do a very good or acceptable in fraud detection terms uh, of uh, protecting this. And uh, it, has, it starts with the with the, the, the clustering thing, it also goes into a bunch of other details. Some of the techniques I will talk about here are, always, are also used in, in frost detection. Uh, there was the network anomaly detection fad, uh, I think seven or eight years ago, which was crumbled under a lot of bad statistics, right? People were just uh, think, uh, assuming that, most of them were just assuming that, yeah, yeah, everything is normal. Let's just alert if something is a couple of standard deviations up and down. From, uh, from what should be. And again, normal is, uh, what's normal in a network is something that's very complicated to, to gauge and then people would be, I mean, they, they bought it, they put it on, it didn't do anything from them, they took it off, nobody ever talked about this again, right? And this is one of the reasons why, in my opinion, predictive analytics gets a bad rap on information security because it kind of has been tried before, but not really, right? The kind of math that they were doing was not the right one. Again, I, I go back to the bad crypto thing. And I don't claim to have solved the problem yet, but I know that's not it. That's, that's totally not it. Uh, spam filters, right? Bayesian filters, have you got, I mean, it's the guy, I mean, it's uh, based, there's the Bayes theorem that you, you have the likelihood of something being a specific thing or other, and it, as you get more evidence on this, it, you get more certain that this thing is, is one thing or another. So it's, this is 98, guys. There's a paper from Microsoft Research that I found where in 98 they were explaining this. This is how long we have been using machine learning and information security. And spam filters, love them or hate them, nobody talks about spam filters anymore. How many talks have you been seeing about spam filters? You know, it's almost like people have solved this problem satisfactory, right? Of course, there's all, I mean, phishing, yeah. Phishing is not spam, it has nothing to do with that. It has specifically been crafted to reach someone, but uh, garden variety spam, that's it. What I'm gonna talk about a little bit about on the last thing here is the predicting likelihood of attack actors. So given that you have information about what these guys did to you in the past, where they were coming from, and some other information that you can get either from inside your network or from outside, could you potentially flag something as being more likely to be attacking you or not? And again, I hit the point where uh, we have to be careful about adversarial intent. So when we were working with spam filters, for instance, we had a good run, and then people started figuring out how base systems work, and uh, they started leaving out words like Viagra or Mads and something like that and started putting like a bunch of Shakespeare at the end of the, at the, end of the email, right? And uh, the, the spam filters were like, yeah, not, not a lot of Shakespeare gets sent through spam, so this must be 
an actual email. And uh, then we caught up with that. And then we improved our spam filters. And uh, the point is, whatever we build, and as we're building it, anyone who wants to dabble in this space any, as well, uh, it's important to understand that people will try to defeat it, will try to break it consistently. So you have to be grounded sometimes, not only in information that can be uh, potentially spoofed by the attacker, which potentially, oh, I, I just destroyed all your log data. I just, I, I, I took possession of a few uh, machines and I subverted the, uh, what, what you would have used as input for your algorithm, but also uh, things that you could gather from outside, from uh, uh, um, I'm calling them extrinsic uh, information, that it's, it's much, much harder to manipulate. Like, where is this IP address on the internet? Or when was this domain name registered? There's, there's not a lot that can be done to, to mask this sort of things. Finally, I guess we should talk about network security monitoring. And it's very close friend, log management, right? I think they're doing a great job managing that log. And uh, we, have, we have guides to log management. We have certifications for logging. But the point is, like these guys here on the, on the, on the low end, we have a whole bunch of logs to be, to be going through. And uh, what I think that uh, we were promised and what was failed to deliver was a way to actually handle this effectively and a way to make this to really, I mean, we're already storing all of this, right? How can we use these things to our advantage? And uh, I think that a great uh, villain in this story is of course our friends, the SIM solutions, right? And uh, when you think about all of the logs that you can gather and all of the different connectors that they have, all the information that you can pull from all the different devices, to think that the only expressiveness that you have is if something happened X times, or if something happened after s other something, uh, uh, given that you, I don't know, they have the same IP address or something like that. And you can, these are your building blocks, your only building blocks, and you're trying to compose something that's potentially very, very complicated, which is, it, could, it, it would be natural for someone who's doing the monitoring, for someone that is an, a, 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 DFR, a DFIR guy, but it's hard to make this sort, express this sort of information into a system like this. And so most of the SIM deployments, they will only uh, make any sense for compliance reasons, right? Or they will, now we really have to use this alerting capability. And then you just iterate and iterate until you run out of money. You pay a bunch of money in, in professional services. And, and that's it, everybody's unhappy. A couple of months down the line, the systems change and all the, the magical numbers that you came up with, um, they no longer make any more sense. And then this thing is abandoned until you, you get to your next budget and you spend, I don't know how many more hours of professional services in order to make this happen. And uh, people have caught up with this and people who are actually trying to do the job, they caught up with this. And uh, we ended up in a way with very two different kinds of information security monitoring. So we have what we, we understand as the alert-based, right? Which would be what this traditional log management things and SIM solutions uh, would be able to provide us, which is, okay, here's a, okay, I just saw this. Go check this out, right? But then the expressiveness that you have is, uh, is something that's very, very low, right? And you have a lack of context, and uh, you do get the results handed out to you, which is very nice, but uh, you use um, the threat intelligence. You can even augment this with threat intelligence, it's something that's been starting to happen for a year or so, but still, eh, it's still like, someone's telling you what you should be looking at, but it's always crap. It's always something that, yeah, all right, yeah, I know about that. Let me just turn off this rule here, you're bothering me. And we have the, what, what the real work that's being done now is more of the exploration based, right? So you have, th this is a trend that started with the network forensics, and now you have the elastic search based uh, log management solutions. And so you'll get some very, very high trained uh, instant response guys. And they will be constantly blowing through this and trying to figure out if there was something, there was some kind of breach or something different that happened. And, uh, and really, uh, okay, no, this was an alert. I actually checked this IP address. I looked the who is, I looked the domain, I got some, some stuff out of Maltigo. I did this whole analysis. Yeah, I'm confident that this guy tried to attack us. Now I have this malware to reverse. 
how many people do we need to do this consistently, right? How many, uh, how many different, very highly trained people we have to do? And then I, I go back to the marketing stuff, right? What people are now uh, theoretically moving forward is what they're calling big data security analytics, the BDSA. And uh, it's pretty much run exploration based on Hadoop, which is going to make it a little bit more slower. You're going to have much, much more data to look for. Uh, to, and to, to sit through, and it's not going to be, I mean, it's, it's not going to, I don't know what you guys think, it sounds really painful to me, right? Um, probably some guys would enjoy it for some reason. You know, I would suggest changing the name to Big Data Security Monitoring. The acronym would probably mean something more expressive. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, it's painful, it's too much work, there's not going to be enough people and there's not going to be enough key analytical capabilities even, because when you're writing Hadoop, when you're writing this massive amount of data, it's going to be challenging w if you don't have also statistics, statistics built in. So what I'm trying to say here is why can't we have both, right? So why can't we have something that's able to do the exploration for you and have enough knowledge and context in order to do this, and it's able to provide you a tip on what you should be doing next. What should you be, uh, it's an alert that has way more intelligence and way more, it looked at way more stuff than just the, 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 the tiny little logs that were there on the sim. And that's why we believe that machine learning could be a solution, right? If you can express and you can uh, enrich the data that you have on the log data with a bunch of different things that you gather from, from I, either intrinsic stuff that you have on, on your, on your, on your, so hi, the history of what has happened before, all the other, the, the log data that you have, and uh, the extrinsic data, so where, where what's the AS, uh, ASN of this IP address, what's the geolocation, what are the domains that will register to it, maybe we can start automating this and create a better way to do alert driven mechanism. And to be fair, I'm quite lazy, I'd rather have the robot catch the bad guy. Right? It's much better. <laughs> much, much better. So anyway, yeah, it's, it's amazing. It's the most amazing thing I've seen like in a couple of years. <laughs> so, so what I did, and this is, this is what I presented in Black Hat uh, and DEF CON, was I did a kind of a proof of concept using just firewall logs, right? We took six months of data from this shield and we, uh, I'm going to go a little bit about the features, but extracting the data from the logs, seeing when it would happen in each time slice, and, uh, and uh, adding this external data from what are the ASs, where does it come from, have I seen this before? And it comes from a lot of intuition from actually doing the work in the field, actually doing some sort of security monitoring and managing this whole bunch of, uh, of sims and things like that. So, at the time, there was a lot of math. I'm not going to go through it anyway. Well. It's, it's all, it, you can look it up, uh, the, the presentation and stuff. It's, it's, it's boring. It's, it's a bit anyway, but the, uh, we had like a 13 to 18 times uh, more like, so the guys that I would suggest would be 13 times to 18 times more likely to have the intention to attack you. So if they show up, if this guy shows up in your log at something that went through the firewall, uh, it would be, uh, Maybe you should investigate this guy because there was, uh, there was a lot of common characteristics with other guys who tried to attack you in the past, right? Today, we, we got this algorithm and we changed it around and we improved a lot of it. It's more like 30 times now when you think about the, the, the pure sense training data. And uh, what we're working with participants is that we, we're pretty much the people who are sending us logs now, we're sending them a stream like, okay, these are the IP addresses you should look for, and about 80% of those, yeah, yeah, no, I, I know you only had the firewall logs, you have no, no way of knowing that, but this guy was actually trying to hit me way down the line on the, on the, the kill chain, or on, on the other the thing that I had. So, yeah, that was a good hit. The other, eight, the other 20%, took some, it's still a, a learning process. I wouldn't expect this to be 100%, to be honest, that's not the point. But the quality of uh, uh, the time saving that these guys are getting, it's, it's interesting. Everybody, everybody's happy. So let's see. So just very quickly, because I'm like running out of time. 
One of, the, one of the main intuitions of this feature is IP proximity, right? What's the neighborhood of this IP address? So geolocation, ASN, even segmenting by net block, right? If you start do counting and doing ratio on this as you try to enrich your, your IP data information, you start to get some interesting results when you try to, to compare this. And then again, it, it, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the features here, I'll talk about the labels soon, but um, this is definitely a, a, a significant thing that you guys wanna look at. And uh, there's a lot of things that support this, the bad neighborhoods. Everyone who has been doing uh, DFIR for a while will know that, yeah, you know, like these guys again, oh my God, I can't, can't get enough of them. So there is, there is, this is definitely something that we can exploit when we're trying to automate this on our end. And uh, an example of this is um, pretty much this graph, which is an attempt to plot the whole internet into a single 2D <laughs> square. And uh, this is called the Hilbert curve, and uh, it's a mathematical construct where pretty much we're trying to increase the proximity between the points. So if you think about this as a straight line, which goes from 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, which is not really an IP, but you get what I mean, to 255, 255, 255, 255, and you curl this, uh, this string up to try to keep things as close as possible, right? You would get some, uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a surface that will try to keep things that are close as, as, as close as possible in, in, in numerical sense. And uh, this is pretty much who has been attacking people on the, on the D-Shield from the 1st of January to the 20th of July. So, and you see it light up and all the, the blue dots. This is not random, guys. Come on, we can exploit this. We can use this to our advantage to try to identify if a specific region of the internet, if they're coming after us on port 22, right, uh, there's an increased likelihood that this guy is coming from this place or that place, right? And if you're wondering, we're right there. That's 12 dots something, that's the Wi-Fi here. And uh, I even pinpointed some guys here. And uh, I put Brazil there, I, just so, so people wouldn't think I was picking on any country. So yeah, Brazil is terrible. I never trust a Brazilian, never. So anyway, we can also think about temporal decay, right? Because people are out to get you, but not all of them at the same time, right? So you just take into consideration when was the last time you saw this IP address, when was the last time you saw these guys, and how frequent has these guys been showing up uh, for me? So um, in a way, you're, you're taking consideration timing because if you have a specific group, a specific group of actors who are trying to target you, they might come from this place right now, and they're like, yeah, this is not really working, let me switch to a different anonymous proxy, and now they're coming from a different region. So based on those two guys, uh, this was what I, what I, one, of the, one of the outputs I originally presented on, uh, on, the, on the DEF CON, which was given only those two features, right? If I was trying to get random IP addresses from, from each class A, right? And what would be the, the likelihood of them attacking me on specific? And again, this was not a specific customer or a case. It was the, the combination of all the SANS D-Shields logs. So it's multiple people, multiple, it's all mixed up. But uh, you can get a pretty good sense that some regions, right, when you apply those techniques, would be more likely to, to, to attack you. And then we did the, uh, the, the analysis, what the true positive was, what the, the false positive was, based on what actually happened the next day. And uh, we, got, uh, we got those numbers that I showed before. So anyway, glad to talk, uh, get, glad to talk more about these results offline. I just don't want to uh, spend too much time on this because I've already talked about this before. Uh, what we've been experimenting lately is DNS features, right? And yeah, no, he, Dan doesn't endorse or even know that his picture is here. But I mean, it's DNS, right? We have to speak of the guy. And uh, a lot of interesting stuff you can be, get from, from DNS, the distribution of the lifetime. There was an interesting talk this, this, this morning about this as well. And uh, what's the entropy of the domains? What's the size of the domains, right? Usually you get like, if it's, Above 14 or 17, it's most likely a, a character, it's most likely a DGA. So there's a lot of stuff that you can start to mine from this information, create a bunch of features, a bunch of numbers, and you can uh, get some interesting stuff, some interesting features to play around. And then you get a bunch of numbers, right? 
So you have your IP address, you have your, you have your domain, and you've got a bunch of features and a bunch of numbers. And this is where it gets tricky, which is pretty much what you define as malicious or not. And uh, for firewall, for firewall uh, uh, logs, it's relatively simple, right? You can define some sort of uh, a threshold based on, 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 the, on the statistical distribution of people who have been trying to hit this firewall, right? If someone is blocked X amount of times, you can kind of infer that they were having malicious intent, and you can easily uh, label this guy as malicious. It's a pretty good bet, right, as we're trying to do. A lot of the work we have been doing lately is um, not so much the actual model that predicts, but the model that will help us figure out what is normal or not in, inside an environment, given the different types of logs that we can get, uh, so that we can safely label something to, ch to push it to uh, different models which, are, are, which would, would work with all these other features on this. So this is, what, this is what I'm telling you about, the difference between extrinsic and intrinsic. And uh, yeah, I can't just make a decision that the, the, a specific ratio of, if I have web server logs, I can't just make a decision, a specific ratio of 200 uh, responses uh, versus the 500s is what would be acceptable for something not to be malicious. You actually have to look at the logs for a while and try to create some sort of uh, time series to see if this is actual normal behavior on multiple levels, not just so much, oh, this is the rolling average of the past few days, that should be it. And that's where people, uh, where I personally believe that people have been kind of sloppy before when they were trying to do this work. Anyway, but anyway, it's easy for security tools. So if you just get firewall blocks or IPS attacks, right, and you feed this in the model, that's, that's, that's kind of trivial. You can pretty much assume. And that's always, that adds up to what we're trying to do. If you want to try this at home, uh, you gotta learn to you gotta learn to code, right? I would I would suggest either Python or R. R is specifically built for statistical uh, uh, analysis. Python has a, has a bunch of uh, of different uh, there's pandas, there's NumPy, there's Sci Scikit-Learn, which you can start to use to play around with data and machine learning. Please, I know it's awful, but try to get some statistic training. It helps, it really, really does. There's a lot of online courses, you don't have to spend a dime, it's just your time. And explore your own data, right? Put it, if you don't have access to your uh, IPS or something like that, you don't have uh, to your NetFlows, just put a security onion there, just talk to your boss and ask to put a security onion there, play around with the logs, and even more importantly, send those logs to me, right? And uh, the point here is that, uh, uh, unless I can work with companies with this, unless I have actual data from them of what's really happening in the real world, this, is, this might as well just be theoretical, right? This might, you, just, you just wasted like 40 minutes of your time of a guy speaking nonsense. And this is exactly what I have been doing for the past six months and working with, with several companies where they have different log data that they are willing to contribute. Most of, these, most of them anonymized. And we, uh, of course, I worked with them in order to make sure that they were comfortable with whatever they were sending, but we would be able to extract the information that we need and, um, and come up with the solutions, right? Train these models and make these things work. And we're kind of hiring, because everybody's hiring, right? We're kind of hiring, but I just don't have any money. But, uh, <laughs> and this is not open source. And uh, so, but anyway, if you're really passionate about this, if you think that this is the future or something, come talk to me and we can probably figure something out. But anyway, everyone's hiring, so I might as well just put them hiring as well. And hit me up. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that you, you can look at. So just, so that, you, just that you guys know, uh, the current research uh, that I have been working with is the inbound attacks, which is pretty much what I what was talking in, in brief at the, what I talked about in DEF CON and, and Black Hat. And uh, there's been a lot of work lately in this malware distribution in botnets, which is, so when you, th you want to talk about the inbound, anything that you have log data that's coming inbound firewall, IPS, WAFs, all these sort of things would be valuable to work with this. The malware, di malware distribution in botnets, DNS logs, web proxy logs, uh, even stuff that you get from, if you have them, like uh, web content filtering, AV, anti-malware, these all help to establish ground truth if necessary, right? And uh, there's some cool semi-supervised learning things going on. 
And uh, I mean, I'm really excited about this model, but I'm even more excited about the other one in which uh, I cheekingly called it a uh, kill chain algorithm, which, uh, and the idea is that as you get different signals from these different uh, tools, how do you combine them to have an even greater certainty that someone is attacking you? So if you think about every single device on your network as having a tiny brain attached to it, and it's doing its own machine learning on the data that it's seeing, what if they could start collaborating with each other to decide if something is more likely to be attacking you or not? This is, I mean, I mean this is way work in progress, but it's, it's, it's looking quite cool. And that's all I got. And if you guys have any... <laughs> Anthony, please. Yep. I'm assuming you've run like PCA on a bunch of data, a bunch of different clients in this like, specific task. What sort of features have you found to be most useful? Well, um, when I talk about the when I talk about the inbound uh, the inbound uh, data, right? The stuff that I get from uh, composing on the on the ESNs and uh, and, uh, and even net blocks, right? You try to, to mash it up a little bit, just to make sure you're not too biased. They used to get the, the most hits. They, used, they, they usually get a higher percentage of explanation, right? Because it's not, it's uncommon for the same IP to appear frequently. The same IP is always, is always coming up. But you, you tend to get a, an overall knowledge of what's going on uh, based on, the, on the, what region it's coming from on a specific time. And the interesting thing is that it varies widely uh, from customer to customer, right? Because uh, some customers, they will be targeted by different, uh, by different actors and coming from different places. So at first, when I, started, when I, when I really started this, I thought, yay, I just created a, a, a blacklist or s of some sort. But it doesn't apply because the blacklist would be different for each specific customer based on what they're seeing. And the beauty of this is that it is actually able to construct this kind of blacklist, right, based on the data that the customer has, and also based on the data that everyone else has. But when, I, when I'm training the model, the features that come from the customer, they get much more importance than the features that come from elsewhere, so to speak. Yes? Kind of a, like a mechanical Turk thing. Uh, that's, that sounds like fun. That sounds like fun. I haven't really thought about that. And uh, it might get some work putting together, but there might be something there. There might be something there. Because, uh, I mean, I'm very lazy, right? And it's laziness that drove me to this. Uh, I could always, I mean, uh, what I don't want to do is to try to classify these things manually, right? And I don't think either of us should. Of course, if someone absolutely completely new shows up, right, it's probably going to make this thing confused, right? If you, if you don't have the features that would be able to express this. But then again, I, uh, we design the features based on what we know, right? And uh, usually what happens is that there is a significant... When there's something that really blindsides me and uh, or blindsides the, 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 the project, we usually have, okay, we have to think of completely different features because there's a whole spectrum of possibility here that we were not, we were not considering. But anyway, it's, it's a cool idea. It's something that, that might be a good way to drive like some sort of community participation if anyone is actually minimally interested in, in what's going on here. Anyone? No, not you. <laughs> Please, Josh, go ahead. So like, many of us have the thought about this, but clearly machine, uh, machine learning is the way to go with this. When it comes to defining like, what's bad and what's not, like, it's a great idea. Like, it's really exciting. It's going to steal your job. What, what do you need? Like, how, do we, how do we have to move forward? Data. More yeah. data. Okay, I don't want you guys to start attacking anyone. That doesn't help, right? 
but uh, there is, I mean, uh, I think I, it has to be orderly, right? Uh, at least that's, that's, that's what I believe. So I can't, I can't just start do getting uh, blind donations of data in the sense that it could might be people just trying to F up with me, right? And uh, so it works a little bit better, it, at least in my mind, you know, and I might be just being, uh, I might not be being greedy enough in this sense, but it, it makes more sense if you are working with, with a company and they are bought into the idea and they would like to, to try to some stuff out, right? Because then it's not so much the data, but also being able to work with them to get the feedback, right? Am I getting this right at all, right? Because it's like, it's, it's one of those things like, no, 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 don't tell me what's on your network. Just send me the logs. It's gonna figure it out by itself. But then you have to. Send something if I got it right or not. Exactly, exactly. But we can totally talk offline if you have some crazy ideas, which are probably. I know, hopefully something <laughs> like that. <laughs> Richard, please. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I know that's a very big question, but obviously, like, you have to have some degree of ground truth in order to say, like, this thing was not. So, like, what, where is the separation there where you can say, like, hey, you know, this is definitely evil, malicious things, and these are not? Because that's, that's a hard problem. That is a very really hard get, problem. Get into the point where you that is a very say, hard like, problem. And, and, the, and the, fa the fairest answer I can give you is that. I'm experimenting a bunch of different stuff, Good. right? And this is where the feedback really comes in handy because I might be too permissive or not permissive enough, right? And uh, to be, again, to be very, very fair, I'm not even sure if any tuning that I do for one company will make even sense for another company. So in addition to this tuning, I'm trying to figure out ways that the system could potentially learn these potential tuning mechanisms itself. So it starts to get a very crazy problem. Where do you draw the line? Yeah. Where do you start telling it what to do? And you're just, ex uh, 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 I don't know, expecting Skynet to, to come out of the blue and just figure out everything for you. But uh, it's part of the journey, and it's being fun. Davi. Just sort of a follow on that. Like, assuming that everything's different for different companies, is there a percentage of success? Because we know the human brain can be fooled from mm -hmm. And machine learning, obviously. Well, I know what I would be aiming for. I would be aiming for something uh, in the vicinity from 80 to 90 percent, because if it's if it's not that, and I'm not saying I'm not saying that it has to tell you what's going on, but if it can point you in the right direction, of where t what you should be spending your time at from 80 to 90 percent uh, of the time, I think that's a good investment, right? Instead of you just blindly looking for stuff to 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 analyze or to look at. And uh, I, believe, I believe that would be a good trade-off, but that's not up to me, right? That's up to whatever the companies are finding this useful or not, right? And this is, this, uh, this is the biggest experiment, maybe, of all this, this thing, right? I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm devoting my time to this, and everybody might turn up and say, yeah, okay, that was, that was fun, but it's not really helping anyone. And that's, that's, really, that's not what I wanna get to, of course, but... Um, uh, it's important that it solves a problem. And uh, I mean, uh, to, to even uh, I mean, add a little bit of, I mean, what I'm trying to do is, in a way, to take responsibility back, if you know what I mean. Because security tools, they will, okay, here's a bunch of tools. Use them, right? Generate your, your, your monitoring capability, right? If you don't do it right now, oh, no, 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 it's your fault. Right, you just, you, you didn't do the right dashboard, or you didn't create the right rules, right? And uh, even though they come, and, and there's, a, there's an example that I like to make, there's a, you get a, you get a, um, a hugely successful SIM tool, right? And has huge deployments all over the, all, all over the world, and uh, you do their training session. Their training session is a month long. You have 20 business days of training, most of it is like, how do you install this? How do you manage the database? Which is utterly pointless in a way, but uh, not a single hour of this is spent explaining to people 
what is the standard content that comes with the, with the tool. So the tools they boast, I have so many uh, 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 correlation rules out of the box, I have this many reports, I have this many things. No, they teach you hours and days on end on how to create new content. In, in a way, they're just, they give, they give, they give given up. Oh, I just put this here? No, don't, don't look at that. Just create your own, right? You, you don't need to bother with this. Nobody really uses this. You should actually create your own. So even if it's, even if it's not 100%, and there's, oh, yeah, there's no 100% security, especially in this field, there's no 100%, right? But if you can take back a little bit of the ownership, right, and you can make the security professionals not so much as a failure, oh, my God, I'm a actually, I'm using the tool wrong. Man, you're set up for failure, right? Let's try to give some agency. Let's try to give some help to what, what should be done. Anyway, that's just, just a random rant about how I feel about these things. Anyone else? That is a secret. But enough, enough, enough. But it's, uh, I, I, I can tell you one thing, I am very busy right now at the moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Happy, happy to talk to you offline as well, okay? All right, guys, that it? Very much.